I'm Robin Dunbar. I'm the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. And I want to very briefly point out, and some of these flyers are outside on the little table with the refreshments, if you didn't see one on the way in, uh, that we have a full lineup this year and looking forward in winter to Professor Mehran Sahami in computer science. Mehran will be talking on January 23rd. And then Professor Hester Gelberg from Religious Studies uh, on February 6th. So this is an opportunity, we hope, to keep this conversation going. Uh, I want to launch us very quickly with today's presentation. Uh, also to let you know that CTL now has a monthly electronic newsletter that kind of highlights both things that are going on in the new website, the Teaching Commons, as well as upcoming events. So if you're wondering how do I keep finding out about things, there's a, an opportunity to subscribe to this monthly newsletter. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's accessible from the very front page of the Teaching Commons, but when Joan gets here, I will confirm uh, how, you, how you can link to that subscription. Uh, but meanwhile, I would rather get us going with our wonderful presentation today, and I'm going to quickly turn things over to my colleague, Professor Tom Ehrlich, who is a CTL faculty fellow, and Tom is going to introduce our speaker. How many times do you get to introduce a real hero? Well, this is one of them. Uh, Professor Gabriel Garcia is our speaker today. He's a doctor of medicine. And insofar as I can tell, he has managed to be a one-man school of medicine in research, in service, and in teaching. I'll come back to that in just a minute, but first I want to stress that he is also a great advocate for public service, and a number of those who are here today uh, uh, know that uh, firsthand, and it's a subject close to my own mind and heart. Uh, his leadership as faculty director of the Haas Center for Public Service from 2006 to 2011, uh, yeah, 11, is the, um, uh, one of the hallmarks of that um, uh, advocacy in that role. He not only uh, talked the talk, uh, which he did, but he, most important, walked the walk. He was a sponsor of Alternative Spring Break uh, for undergraduates who examined issues of farm workers in Salinas Valley. He also worked very closely with an organization founded by medical students to advocate for LGBT patients and their providers. He was born in Cuba, educated at Cornell and NYU, did postgraduate work here at Stanford, and to our great good fortune, uh, he never left. Uh, he's a uh, diplomat in internal medicine, also one in the National Board of Examiners. As a medical school uh, faculty member, his resume is 31 tightly packed small print pages. Don't worry, though, I'm not going to, uh, don't, uh, to read it, but I will say it's awesome. Uh, but it's as a teacher that we hear him today, and what a teacher he is. He has taught numerous courses in community health advocacy, focusing particularly on ensuring that Stanford medical students and graduates have the knowledge, the skill, the wisdom they need to provide medical care for populations that are underserved. Uh, one example is the spring break program he leads on community health in Mexico, which is designed for medical students, committed to working with uh, immigrant populations He's received the 2012 Roland Volunteer Service Prize for involving students in integrating academic scholarship with significant and meaningful service to society. He's received the Medical Schools Diversity Award, and this year he received the school's Family Faculty Professional Award. Dr. Garcia is the William and Dorothy K. University Fellow in Undergraduate Education which is the catalyst uh, for his speaking with us today. And with great pleasure, I ask you to join me in welcoming him to the podium. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom.
Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, so I'm going to start by what most people end with, which is showing you uh, why I'm here. Uh, why I'm here is because I have wonderful partners, OK? And I want to stress uh, Anne Bantroff, who I don't see in the audience, but Anne uh, is my co-teacher in every class I teach. She's taught me both how service learning pedagogy is uh, is um, learned, but also how it is taught. And uh, she's doing here uh, what she does very, very well, which is engaging people at their community sites in conversations for mutual benefit. Um, our partners, who is a, a small group of the partners of the different classes that we teach, um, mostly in our community safety net clinics, but some, and some of them in our community sort of social services agencies, like the Day Worker Center in Mountain View or in uh, our Pescadero uh, colleagues. And then finally our students, who this is probably a class of graduates from about three years ago. Um, and I'm indebted to them because my career up to, I would say, about 10 years ago was relatively focused and narrow in, uh, in caring for patients with uh, liver disease, which is what I do for my clinical life, and in doing mostly research in, in that area. And I moved to a much more engaged uh, sort of role w with uh, my time at the Haas Center, which I, which I love yeah. and I still cherish and I still uh, relate to. And, uh, and with my close relationship with everyone at the Office of Community Health, some of which are here. Um, so, so let me just first tell you about the community context in which this takes place. And we, we live in the county in California that has the highest median household income, right here, this county that we live in. And when you think about that, you say, we should be able to achieve a lot. It's the 14th highest income in the nation as well. So we're not, not only a a wealthy county locally but nationally. But in, but in many ways, we still have a third of the families who don't earn a living wage for our county. And one in 10 children and one in 12 adults uh, live in poverty today in our county. Um, we lack health insurance for, um, for two in 10 adults, three in 10 African American residents, four in 10 Latino residents. About 10% of our adults, when they seek health care, uh, delay or don't get their prescriptions filled, mostly because they don't have the money to fill them. And about 10% of our adults uh, obtain food from, blood, blood, uh, from food banks, churches, et cetera, regularly. So, so this is our county. And this is the way I see our county, is that it's wealthy and there's a significant number of people who have needs. And so when, when we look at summary data, it's hard sometimes to see the underside and the underbelly of this community data. And that's where I like to work. Okay? And so one of the questions that you ask is, as a medical educator as well as a general educator, how should medical education react to our context? Because health is about circumstances. It's not about health care. It's about the life that you live and where you live it. It's about your neighborhood. It's about your environment. It's about your behaviors. And so how do we change the way that we educate for medicine in order that we address the issues that we know, the underbelly? And, and I'm going to refer you to a, to a very nice uh, opinion piece that was written by, uh, by colleagues at Cal, at the School of Public Health, which basically asked the question, how should our education change so we can actually address issues of health, not health care. Okay? And they felt that a few things were important. And the first was that we should recruit students who come from or have a desire to serve all communities. Mm -hmm. That we should develop partnerships that are between campus organizations and community organizations in service learning and participatory research. That we understand and provide solutions to real problems in real communities in real time. And that we should embrace social change. And part of that is really learning who holds the power to make the change, who must be mobilized to exert the necessary pressure, and learning how to exert that pressure. And so I, I took this seriously. And I figured I could actually teach to all of those things. 
uh, I was doing some at that time, but I figured I could actually think of that as my, as my learning goals for my classes, and I thought they were good. I'm a good friend of John Schwartzberg. He actually preceded me in a pro my postdoctoral lab, so we talked about this. Um, so I added a fifth, which was why wait till medical school, right? Why wait? I mean, this is an issue that has very little to do with medicine. It has something to do with medicine. It's mostly to do with neighborhood and circumstances. And so, actually, the, it's even more interesting. So I was teaching a really heady seminar called The Human Side of Medicine, in which we read and spent time in a classroom and talked about the physician-patient relationship to, to, as a freshman seminar. Well received, very well liked. And um, sometime in the middle of my second, semester, second quarter teaching it, Anne walked into my room and he said, don't you think that if you actually saw, have them see physicians at work, that you might get them to learn a little bit more about the physician-patient relationship? It was a, sort of an aha moment for me. And I said, yeah, how would you do that? And she gave me a syllabus. And so I took the syllabus, I read it, and I said, this is good. We can go with this. And we've been teaching since. Um, and this is, in fact, the learning goals from the beginning. We initially called it the patient advocacy program, but it got confused with some of the roles of some of our hospital employees, and so we now have changed it to the Community Health Advocacy Fellowship. And, and, and the needs that we wanted to address were the following. The, the, the needs among our area safety net clinics for reliable, trained volunteers to enhance patient care. The demand among students for substantive clinical and community service experiences, particularly with underserved populations. And for me as a medical educator, the need to build a diverse and culturally competent healthcare workforce. So, so those were the drivers of what we were going to do. And, and we created a couple of components to this program. One of them was uh, the initial our initial class, which was really it met two hours a week and to build knowledge and to some degree some skills. Our students worked three to four hours a week in one of our safety net clinics with one of our long-standing partners. They had a weekly reflection that was due that we used, in fact, to ground their, um, their experiences in the clinic with some analysis of what was going on and why it was going on. And uh, they also had to develop first a relationship and then a project with their clinic. Okay. And, and I stress that order because, in fact, the relationship was, was actually was led to the project every time. Okay. And so they spent the first quarter just developing and understanding the work of the clinic and then came up with a literature search to inform the project and then came up with a project that they generally did their winter and spring quarters. Um, we had a... Um, uh, we had lots of learning goals, and I'm going to put them all here, okay? And generally, you, you want two or three learning goals, right? We were ambitious. We had a dozen learning goals, because we thought that if you actually asked students to do hard work and raise the bar high and gave them lots of support, you could actually achieve a lot. So we actually pre-screened our students and made sure that they were students who were already committed to serving and already understood the context of health. Okay? And so by starting with students there, we could actually go and take them to the next level. So we limited our class to about 15 students a year. And we only took as much as our community uh, partners could handle in their co-teaching role with us. And so every year the class went up or down in size, depending not on student interest, but on partner interest. Okay. And so as you read these, what you'll see is that it's very public healthy. What we wanted them to understand is that healthcare doesn't give you health. Circumstances give you health. That we, they get to know the underserved populations of the Bay Area and why they are underserved. And what is the history behind it? What is the economics behind it? What is the education behind that? and that we analyze root causes in the same way that our basic scientists do it at the medical school, we look at root causes from other sources. And why does this happen? Um, get to know the programs that we, uh, that we have in our communities, both governmental and non-governmental programs that, uh, that fund the health care and health for our underserved communities. Articulate a position on social on the social role of healthcare workers, and we believe that healthcare workers have an individual 
uh, advocacy role, but they also have a community advocacy, a legislative advocacy, and other types of advocacy that they can do. And we trained them to do so. Um, we thought that we could get most of them, and we've succeeded in getting some of them, to think about, so what, how do you answer the questions? How do you answer the questions that you will pose yourself during the time that you're in service and develop some research? And I'll show you some examples of that. And uh, it generally started by developing a project with a partnering clinic or social service organization in our community and making sure that we were doing something that, that served their need. Um, some of the unique aspects of that particular program were the fact that it was a longitudinal engagement. We asked the students to commit to one year. We would not take any students who wouldn't commit to a year. And most of the students who entered in their freshman or sophomore year stayed with us until graduation, which as you know here increasingly is five years after entrance. And so we had a cohort of some students who were with us four and one student who's with us five years, and one student who continues to still come, even though she's working in this area. Um, so we thought longitudinal engagement would be very important, and we thought it was essential for developing the kind of deep partnerships and multi-layered partnerships that we were hoping to see. Um, we made a community responsive. In fact, in some ways, their success in their coursework and their success in their projects was in their capacity to make their community partner look really good. Not them look really good, but their community partner look really good. Okay? And we created opportunities for student leadership among those students who, who had their second and third and fourth and subsequent years with us. So, and I'll tell you about those. So the longitudinal um, engagements really occurred sometimes with the course itself that they came, although in subsequent years after the first year, we actually met with them less frequently and they spent more time with their community partner. Okay. Um, and in their clinic shifts could involve health screening, health coaching, interpretation, health education and counseling, and resource referrals. And as they realized the limitations of the resources of the clinic to do all those things, many of the projects that they created said, we don't have a good referral manual. We don't have good health coaching training. We don't have this. And that was the way that they, in fact, discussed with their partner to say, we don't have an electronic health record. Well, we can build you all that. And so different students who had different uh, skills actually built electronic health records and came up with a health coaching curriculum and did all those things. It really depended on finding the adequate, finding the right match between the student and the need of the partner. Mm -hmm. And as they have their weekly clinic shifts, their relationships have, have, have strengthened. Their uh, integration into the role of that they do into the clinic, then they become almost like another employee. They're just not on the payroll. They're on our payroll, as we say. Uh, their confidence in their role enhances. Um, and I think they get a better understanding of who the population that's served is and what they do. And I'll give you some examples of some of our course evaluations so that you can see that that's the case. Um, the classroom time for us was just, was just as important. Because this, this is the time when you were able to discuss this. What did you see and what is the context of what did you see and how do you relate to the readings and how do you relate to the knowledge that you have acquired as part of your class. Um, and it was important to ground their observations in the theoretical network uh, framework, not only of service learning, but of really of service in general. And, uh, and cultural competency for me doesn't begin to describe the ability to be effective across differences. That's very important. I think of it in my medical field as patient-centered care, but I think of it as very ecologically uh, as a patient who sits within a family, a community, a culture, many cultures. And so the idea that they frame it only in, in culture actually goes away as they spend time with us when they realize that what they were previously framing as cultural differences were, uh, were actually economic differences or educational differences or legal status differences, et cetera. And they expand their idea. And then they become to our notion, which is you want to be respectful and ethical and effective across differences. Um, our clinic projects are always, always at the uh, request of the partner. 
Uh, in fact, if there is no project request for the partner, what we do is we help them do a needs assessment and then agree on what the needs assessment shows. So you'll see that one of the projects I'll tell you about was exactly that. Um, the first year students actually work on the projects throughout their first year. And some of them, um, I don't see who's we'll in the audience, but some of them actually step out a year from, good, take advantage of the community-based research fellowship from the Haas Center, get a grant, and then work with that community partner for a year, and then come back and, and re-enter class later. And I'm working with a young man now and, and at the Samaritan House Clinic in which he's actually studying the uh, health coaching intervention in patients with diabetes at that clinic. And he stepped out a year to do this, and he thinks that this will be as important a part of his education as the rest of the time he spent here. Um, we generally have poster presentations in which we have a community partner who is not only a co-author, but, uh, but generally the major presenter. And uh, we generally invite most, most of our community members to come. One of the nice things about that event is many of our safety net providers or our administrators of the clinic, et cetera, actually don't speak to each other except at our events. And so we convene people who, who, who do the same work, who have the similar needs, et cetera. And that's the time I said, oh, he built you an electronic health record? We need one of those. And then we get some ideas of how to, in fact, get the community to, to benefit from some of the things that we're doing. Yeah. Um, and some of the sample projects that we've done, a lot of them had to do with, with client satisfaction at all the clinics. When we did one at Mayview, which is a clinic down in the courthouse in Palo, in, in Palo Alto, everybody wanted patient satisfaction, so we did, did them in all of them. Um, um, exploring mental health resources in a place that doesn't deliver easily accessible mental health resources was important, so one of our students spent a significant amount of her time actually developing that. She's not one of our road scholars. Establishing an insurance enrollment program at Pacific Free Clinic as the Affordable Care Act comes in and people become eligible for that in your entry place for clinics. There's a lot of enrollment is going to take place. It takes eight hours to train an individual, maybe fewer hours for Stanford students, to actually teach them how to do enrollment, and we can deploy them to do that relatively easily at their request. Um, Ravenswood Fa Family Health Center has seen a lot of our a lot of our uh, uh, students. That's what we call it Crossing 101. Uh, it's a little bit on, uh, it's a riff on Crossing Figueroa, a very nice uh, paper that uh, one of our graduates, George Sanchez, wrote about his uh, experience at USC doing community engagement. Um, but again, Many of you might remember that when we started One East Palo Alto, and one of the things that was desired by the community in East Palo Alto is a more significant way of how to manage their asthma care. And we really weren't able to deliver on that from our end. And part of the, what we're doing now is going back to those initial sort of desires for uh, services by the community and seeing how can we provide those in a way that we build capacity in your clinic to do the same, rather than having a relationship which d depends on travel, depend, have an on-site management strategy. Um, and uh, this is the, the project at Samaritan House. Uh, Gustavo is actually stepping out to do this year. Uh, and it follows another student who Samaritan House is having some trouble getting provider volunteers, and she worked with them in setting up a system that, uh, that enhanced their capacity to do so. Um, student leadership, uh, most of you just assign them roles as they spend more time with us, and some of them become the coordinators of the clinic who train and see other advocates in each clinic. And they, a lot, you know, they participate with us responding to their reflections and giving them some nuts and bolts problem solving to, uh, sessions on site. Um, they also are the brokers of the conversations that take place. I think faculty presence is, is important at those conversations, but, but it's not as frequent as others who participate in this project. And so we train our more senior students to actually become uh, facilitators of those conversations and making sure that, they're, that they get feedback on when it went well and when it could go better. Okay? Um, and we've generally had course 
uh, coordinators who help us with the syllabus. Anne and I refer to our syllabus as the, uh, as the organic one because it, really, it literally changes every year based on student input and based on our evalu course evaluations. Um, um, the second part that we've actually now taken out of the class and actually will offer it as a separate class is media and legislative advocacy training. We used to just embed it into this class, but we think that many other students might be interested in this. So we actually took out some sessions from that. We're going to collaborate with the Merkley um, Media Advocacy Group, actually one of their former employees, um, who's taught the class with us before. And, and you know, the learning objectives are different for legislative advocacy or professional advocacy than they are for media advocacy. We think our students actually learn to do both because part of advocating is to know how to state the facts and frame them in a way that they can be understood, not as changes in individual behavior, but as environmental and systemic issues that need to be addressed in a different way. And so um, our learning objectives for that part of the class is really exploring the role of the media in shaping community health debates. And again, taking it away from individual behavioral decisions, okay, and moving it into the public health arena. And learning how to engage media successfully to achieve that goal. Because if we're talking about childhood obesity, it's very likely that that front page picture is going to be of someone who's obese. And what we really want is a front page picture that actually looks at the environment in which this is taking place. And you can help someone change that message and change the frame in which you're looking at it. Um, and so a lot of what people do is just read current events and see how they're portrayed in the media, follow a particular issue in the media, and then give feedback to the uh, writers of the articles about it. Um, and get an understanding of how they can part you can partner with those people who write those articles to really advance your goals. For the legislative advocacy training is, is really learning how to define the problem, learning how to particularly define the solution, okay, and making sure that that can be spelled out clearly. As academics, we spend most of our time defining the problem and understanding what the problem is, and there are some of our publications that, that refuse to consider that we actually write about a potential solution. They say that's for others to do. This is the other opposite. Okay, but what you're looking at is to say, we know this problem exists, simply state it, and then say, the solution is going to be this. And then how do you find the person who's really in charge of making that change, and how do you affect the change in that person? And so part of what they will do during that class, spend some time in Sacramento with us, speak to our local legislators who are co-teaching the class with us, speak to our local uh, faculty who are actually the government liaisons at the different schools and at the medical center, et cetera, who are constantly in dialogue with this and hope for some good results. Um, so one of the things that became very clear as we deployed our students to our safety net clinics in the area is that safety net care in this area is predominantly immigrant care. So the clients of our safety net clinics Many, many of them actually are coming from communities who are born abroad and are here as new Americans. And so how do you sort of begin to address issues of the intersection of migration and poverty and health? Because everybody who's coming here, they're coming here to get a job. Okay? And so we, in partnership with the Bing Overseas Studies program and others, we actually decided that we would want to study sending communities as well as receiving communities. So the Community Health in Oaxaca program was actually an outgrowth of the Community Health Advocacy Fellowship. And we felt that immersive training would allow us to build cultural and linguistic skills, that we could provide the foundation for our students to serve in a more informed way the increasingly diverse uh, society that we live in. And we also engage them in some projects in the sending community so that they got to learn the sending communities better. So this was an interesting project. This is one that we did last summer when we were there. And what we decided to do was something that was what I would call false photo voice. So photo voice is a technique in which you actually engage a, uh, a, a community member to examine visually and reflect on their communities and provide some solutions and look for ways of enable those solutions. 
uh, the need that our one of our clinic partners had in Oaxaca. It's not a clinic. It's a uh, it's a uh, comedor. It's actually a, a, a um, an organization that supports kids uh, staying in school. And they have 700 kids. We need one year. We did a health assessment and a dental health assessment <laughs> on them. But this year, they wanted them to un understand how to photograph and how to use certain software in the computers. So we had. First, to make sure that our students knew how to photograph and use certain software in the computers. And they all, all but one did, actually. And, uh, and then we said, well, we can do that, but we want them to have a learning goal that's good for everybody. And so what we decided to do is to actually, we purchased cameras and we gave cameras to the organization so the kids could take the cameras home because most of the kids come to the capital, come to Oaxaca de Juarez, which is the capital of the state, only for their education, but their families live in the surrounding villages. And um, for, for practical reasons this year, we had to have a very safe trip. And because we had to have a very safe trip, we had no trips that were unsupervised outside of the capital. And so we used the camera to place our students through the lens of the child in the child's community. And so what they did was they actually brought the photographs back, they learned how to put them in the computer, they learned how to write the, the essay that went with each of the photos. And then we presented that for them because they're going to use it for fundraising and the kinds of things that these stories are good for. Uh, for our students, it was a way to learn about a community that they never actually visited, but they saw it through their child partner's eyes. It was very effective, I thought. And when our students reflected on their experience, some of the really important interactions for them were the interactions not only with their host families, but with the kids at the uh, centro. Uh, I'm making the assumption that you know where Oaxaca is, but I want to bring you up to date. It's here. So it's uh, southern Mexico. It's a state with a third of the households speak, speak an indigenous language. It's a very rural state. The way they describe the geography is they crumple up a piece of paper and they throw it at a desk because it actually looks like that. It's a, there's, lot, there's three um, mountain ranges that actually end there. It's a place of great biodiversity. It's a great a place of uh, human diversity. Uh, and it has um, a, uh, and they are, they are the internal migrants of Mexico. And so for them, crossing the border to come work in this country is incidental, because they've been used to going to Veracruz, to, to Baja, to Michoacán, to all of the other places to work the service jobs of Mexico. So, so this is the population that we were particularly interested in. And, and we chose it, in it as well because we had an on-site partner on the ground there that we knew that we could work with. Um, and and just, just to give you a sense, about 4 million Mexican immigrants live in California, but in about 60,000 of those immigrants from the state of Oaxaca live in our area. And mostly are working construction in the cities and mostly are working farms in the rural areas. Um, they live in transborder communities. They maintain very close ties with their home communities. And uh, because of their, um, because of their way of governing, which they call usos y costumbres, which is the way I translate it, not literally, is the way we do things here. It's not constitutional, but it requires men and women electively to actually participate in all of the services. So they could call up one of our migrants who's raising artichokes in our fields and say, you're going to be mayor next year and you need to come back. And they either come back or pay a fine. And uh, they do. So it's a participatory government in that way. And it's one that creates decisions by consensus. Um, and, and in order to do that, you need to know where you came from, and you need to know, and you need to maintain those close ties. And they do. Um, when they come here, one of the things that's clear is they work in our most dangerous occupations: farming, fishing, uh, construction work. Okay, and they do so without having good access to health care. So dangerous occupation, not good access to health care. Um, so we were equally ambitious in our <laughs> learning objectives for that program. I mean, we, we, our idea is you set a high bar, you support them really well, and if you have to choose which learning environment, which learning goal you want to take, it's okay with us. 
But, but our idea is really that you should, in fact, devote a significant amount of your time in doing this. And so we, we teach this class as a pre-field seminar in the spring quarter and then a summer trip to Oaxaca and right after uh, the end of the quarter. And so that students can actually come back and do some additional work that summer before they come back. And I'm not going to read it, all of these to you, but, but they involve understanding what the drivers of migration, understanding that particularly for Mexican migration, it's a multi-ethnic process that has amazing social layers that they must understand. Okay. That, and part of what we do is to identify then the different indigenous groups from that area and how they stack up hierarchically and how that hierarchical sort of uh, structure gets replicated in our farms. Because okay. it's the same as for them, it's no different if they're picking sugarcane in Veracruz or they're picking strawberries in Gilroy. In many ways, the same social hierarchy that existed there gets replicated here in our farms. Um, they also learn about the healthcare system in Mexico, and the purpose of learning that is to realize, so what are the expectations of our migrants from our healthcare system based on their experiences from before, and understand a little bit of the differences, and particularly the power and privilege differences between providers and receivers of care in those communities. Okay. Um, and uh, we spend a little bit of time talking about cultural humility. We teach it with colleagues from throughout the university and from certain sources. Seth Holmes, who's spoken here a couple of times, is a physician anthropologist from Cal. He's written a beautiful book recently about our farms and our farm workers. And his, he was the one who did the social hierarchy in our farms based on his PhD thesis. And he lived for a couple of years in a uh, Washington State uh, strawberry and apple farm. Um, Rebecca Hester was working with Jonathan Fox, who is a political scientist at UC Santa Cruz. She was a graduate student who was working with him, and she is a political scientist, and um, she also did feminist studies, and she mostly um, talked about the transborder community and what are the implications of living not a mi migrant's life, but a transborder life. Okay. Uh, Rufino Dominguez Santos runs the largest indigenous Mexican uh, union for farm workers in the country, uh, or ran it until two years ago. He was now hired by the new governor of Oaxaca to be in his cabinet. And so I met him last summer, had lunch with him to see how he saw his cabinet work as different than his union work, and he's got a, an immense number of stories to tell. And. Carrie Lobel is the executive director of an organization in, uh, in Pescadero, California, and right on the southern San Mateo coast, who in 2008, after our, our, um, our economic downfall, lost their health care provider. And we're working with her agency, because she's the only game in town, or her agency is the only game in town, and provides mental health worker, uh, mental health care, as well as sort of health care screening and transportation, et cetera. And I'll tell you a little bit about one of the projects that we're doing to actually bring healthcare back to Pescadero. Um, the course components in Oaxaca means that we actually don't have a brick and mortars campus there. We've been going there now four different times. And Ramon and I are thinking about a different way of thinking about overseas programs without a brick and mortars program, but would actually would one that's based on partnerships and maintaining partnerships over time. And so our students always stay with homestay families. They tend to be the same families every year. They get to know them because they're the families that generally work with the language school in which they all enroll. They have clinical rotations because they all are interested in the way the healthcare system works. And so they work predominantly in what they call centros de salud or casas de salud, which is one of the ambulatory health centers in Mexico. What's interesting about them is that they're responsible not only for healthcare but for public health. Okay, as well. So if we're there and there's a dengue outbreak, the students go from the clinic and go beat on doors and start looking at backyards and lifting uh, sort of still water containers, uh, all that kind of stuff. So they get an, a different view of what healthcare is from a country that does public health and healthcare in, in an intertwined way. We have Oaxaca-based faculty as well as Anne and I who go there every year. They, they, they do Spanish language training, weekly cultural cultures, et cetera. We had one cultural trip this year. Uh, 
But most of what they really like, at least at our evaluation, is the fact that w there's this terrace in the middle of the city that has a really nice, uh, let's call it a bar. Because uh, <laughs> that's what it is. But it's non-alcoholic beverages as well. So we, we, we meet there every Sunday afternoon for our weekly office hours. And all 15 came, and we would just sit there and just have office hours as a group. And that was probably, for us, and, and I believe for the students, was the best part of that class. Um, one of the prior studies that we did, in addition to this uh, sort of pseudo -vo voice that we did this year, was we actually did community asset mappings, because all of the clinics that they work with were surrounded by neighborhoods that were actually quite different from each other. And one of the things that I felt would be important for the students to do is to learn how to map assets, not just difficulties or barriers. And so we use the Northwestern approach to community asset mapping as as interpreted by Google, because now there's a Google map having community assets of, around all these clinics that's on the internet that you can look at that our students did for that particular project. I'm going to show you the evaluations so that you understand what we're trying to achieve and how they, they gather to our goal. Um, we, have, we, as we say, evaluate well. Um, and so uh, the lighter bar is the pre pre-course survey and the, so, and the darker bar is the post-course survey. And so when you look at the knowledge part of what they were able to acquire as a result of the course, I think we can usually see that there's a significant knowledge acquisition in those areas that were our learning goals before. So whether it was cultural humility or whether it was the, um, the multi-ethnicity of the migration, et cetera, people, our students generally understood and learned uh, et but, but more importantly, um, they, they also became more confident in working with us. They came to us with high levels of confidence. I mean, seven is good uh, in our Likert scale. And they, they all came with good sandwich speed proficiencies and confident that they were willing to serve and serve well. And we think we took them from that level of competency and, in fact, gave them some additional skills mostly additional confidence that they would do a good job. This year we also partnered with our colleagues at the Center for Teaching and Learning in looking at what were the, what were the outcomes of the course that were tied to Sue's interests. In other words, to the goals of the, of the study of undergraduate education at Stanford. And so we, uh, I'm gonna give you, I mean, we, they filled out a 17 page survey. So it was, a, uh, it was uh, they all filled it out. And they did it without survey fatigue. <laughs> anyway, it was wild. But, but, but the idea is that we really wanted to use this as a pilot to understand, can we, in fact, teach towards some of the goals of SUS? And this is what we found. Essentially, 100% of students felt they encountered at least some situations that allowed them to take, that encouraged them to take educational risk, intellectual risk, interpersonal risk, questions my assumptions and beliefs, and reflect in my own identity. And most of them actually thought that they encountered a lot of circumstances. Okay? None encountered none. Okay? The majority of students, the overwhelming majority, felt more confident in the ability to face new challenges and adapt to new situations. And 100% of students were able to integrate what they had previously learned on coursework at Stanford with this program, and 80% strongly so. There were similar outcomes that had similar numbers. So, so we're convinced that, in fact, we can use engaged scholarship to achieve these goals. I'm going to finish just by talking about a few of our projects. Um, this educational agricultural intervention we did in the, in, in the outskirts of Oaxaca, uh, partnering with an organization, curiously also called Puente, that provides uh, education and agricultural um, uh, sort of knowledge to, uh, to, to small communities. And what we looked at was well, how did it impact the nutritional state of their zero to five year olds. Um, this was a uh, scholarly concentration project by one of our medical students who's now getting a combined internal medicine degree and PhD in epidemiology based on in fact, that she really wants to create a career in which she studies these kinds of things. Um, 
The second one is the availability and use of interpreter services for indigenous migrants in clinical environment. And this was a study that was done both by a medical student who's now in the social medicine uh, residency in Montefiore and, uh, and by an undergraduate who's chosen to stay in her home state of, uh, Oregon, of Oregon to go to medical school, but is working, but spent the year between, medical, between undergraduate years. And they're working in the, with the uh, farm workers working in the wine industry many of whom are Oaxacans, uh, in preparing for the kind of work that she was going to do in medical school. And uh, I want to tell you about this, the health needs of farm workers in coastal San Mateo County. Um, this is also a scholarly concentration project by one of our current medical students. Jesse was also one of our patient advocates when she was an undergraduate here, spent two years doing what they do in their gap time, doing wonderful work in South America, and then came back to study medicine with us. And what Jesse did was work with uh, Carrie Lobel at uh, Puente in Pescadero and, and ask the question, so now that we don't have a healthcare provider, what are the healthcare needs of this community? And how can we best serve them? And she knocked on every door and she looked at previous uh, healthcare needs assessments that were done and asked the question, what is new? What can we do? that would be different. And identified in the community three basic needs. The, one, the first one was health literacy, health promotion, and health navigation. That is, how can you navigate the healthcare system to promote your own health? Okay. The second one was case management, but more importantly, self-efficacy training. That is, how can individuals of the community teach themselves to help themselves to achieve better health state? And the last one was what everybody knew, which is there was no provider. There hasn't been one there for five years. And so her project report to me, I was her faculty advisor for the project, was made some recommendations. And the first one was to hire six community health care workers that could be deployed in particularly the labor camps of this community. To increase the existing public health nurse's time to 100% so that she could not only engage in case management, to which she limited her practice now, to self-efficacy training, which will be to create teachers who teach how to care for yourselves. And, to, and she recommended that we hire a, phys a physician jointly with the County Health Services in Half Moon Bay so that the care of the patients in Pescadero would be integrated with the health care of, of the county. And so sometimes political things sort of tend to collide nicely. Because what happened was that the uh, then uh, county sheriff of that area, Don Horsley, he became uh, retired and then ran for county supervisor and got elected. And he's very close to this community, very close to this community. He was a sheriff there. He knows everyone there. And he stated at one of the Puente fundraisers where I was that if uh, Measure A passed, and those of you who live in San Mateo County know that we're paying a little bit more money, this is where it's going to go. I'll tell you, it's going to a good cause uh, for our taxes for the next eight years. He said, Measure A passes, we'll get health care there. And, and his plan was just to hire a physician. And we said, You don't need to do that. In fact, in some ways, you, you probably are better off not doing that and actually taking some time from somebody who's already working within the county system who, who wants to work times when farm workers are available, which means evenings and Saturdays or Sundays, and have most of the work be elsewhere. But what you really need is the infrastructure that's very relevant and very parallel to the way that these farm workers who have come from sending communities we're used to getting their health care back home. So we use the community health workers, the promotoras uh, uh, sort of model to do it. And you know what? They funded it. So now, as of sep late September, the supervisors, based on our presentation, actually Carrie Lobel's presentation, which I supported and Jesse wrote, uh, uh, have funded health care for this. So, so some of our products are academic products, and some of our products are products in the political arena, and we're happy with both. So my job now is to take some sabbatical time so I can figure out how to train the six community health workers, and I'm going to look for lots of partners here who have done that before. Um, and I'm going to have to help carry define and the county define uh, what are the qualities that we're looking for in this health care provider. 
Okay, because I don't want this person to be thought of as someone who's taking a part-time job in a disenfranchised community. I want this person to be someone who wants to work there and think of his other job as the part-time job. Yeah, because my, my sense is that when that person arrives there and sees the community that's there, that they want to spend most of their time there. We're going to have to sort of break it slowly to them <laughs> that most of their salary is coming from something else. Um, I want to finish with some student reflections. Um, um, the time that I spent with my project partner, both of the class but by myself, was a great way to learn about a new culture from a local size. And that was partnering with a student in this Oaxaca sort of pseudo photo voice program. The experience has helped me understand the importance of taking consideration all aspects of the patient, including family and socioeconomic status. So in some ways, that's our goal. Our goal is to see that health is contextual. Um, enjoying meeting the host families was one of the big part of the Oaxaca things. The ability to live with someone, um, um, comida is, there, is lunch, and uh, so we would have a wide range of discussions about politics, culture, food, and their openness to share their cultures with us was heartwarming and helped me to appreciate the diversity of Mexican culture so much more. This last one is worth reading, although it's long, and it's, it was written by one of our students in our early community health advocacy program. She, she, she writes, uh, I always had this sense that people chose to do research or clinical medicine based on their personalities. She, she has a career as a physician now. Some people like labs and rats and test tubes and Excel, and some people like patients and hospitals and developing relationships. I like medicine because I like people, so recently I thought that research was just not for me. Thinking back, I realize that many of the most brilliant researchers I met at Stanford and here in Columbia don't seem antisocial at all. I thought that was sort of an interesting thing. They seem just obsessed with their work um, in an exciting, contagious sort of way. And she mentioned some of our great faculty members. In this sense, I can absolutely see myself pursuing research, being taken by something and just running with it. And part of the reason I can picture that is my patient advocacy program allowed me to do this at a small scale. So what she decided to do is that she felt, I think correctly so, that issues of nutrition and issues of obesity were going to plague her medical career and her practice forever, that someone had to solve these. So instead of going straight to medical school, she decided that she would go to a very, very good nutrition sciences program at Columbia University, get a master's degree, understand the relationship between nutritional sciences and medicine so that she could, in fact, approach her patients. I thought that was a wonderful wonderful, not detour, wonderful enhancement of her capacity to do well in her future career. So I'm going to stop here because this is, I want the student's voice to be the last and happy to take some questions. Yes. I teach courses in the history department in immigration and public service. And increasingly, I'm getting students interested in health issues. Uh, do you incorporate undergraduates into this program? Oh, yes. May I send them to you? Well, no, these, are, these are all undergraduate programs. I, oh, they I are. didn't oh, make I that they clear. Were Okay. No, 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 no. I start early. I start as early as I can. Okay, I have two students who are, one is doing work on diabetes in the Ravenswood and the other one on mental health and immigration and I would love to see them be more connected. No, no, we will, we will take uh, applications for the Community Health Advocacy Fellowship during the winter quarter uh, and um, require them to take a gateway class, which I teach with Kathy Heaney, called Foundations and Community Health Engagement during the spring quarter, and so that they come prepared. I'll send them back to you. And um, we're, okay. we would be delighted to have your students. Thank you. No, uh, the, the alternative spring break 
uh, that I teach in the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota is the only one that actually has medical students and I didn't tell you about that one. It's the only one that has medical students and undergraduates at the same time. This, everything I talked about here is mostly for undergrads. The courses, some of the projects are joint projects between undergrads, medical students, and the locals. Come on. So let me just add to what Gabriel has just said. Uh, that I, I, Every day that I wake up, I get down on my knees and I thank God for Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> for bringing this wonderful project to BOSP to ask us to partner, at least with this portion of it, with, with him. Because it's been a magnificent addition to overseas studies. It does so many of the things that overseas studies should do in exciting, new, and expansive ways. You know, cultural immersion, language learning, community engaged learning um, and um, research at extraordinary levels. So my only question to you, Gabe, is what do we do for an encore? You know, and I mean that seriously. I mean, given what has been so immensely successful in these pilot versions, and now that we're thinking about institutionalizing this longer term, how, how can we grow this program? And, and I ask that question seriously, because right now, budgetarily, we're limited to 15 students. We had over 75 apply for this, mm -hmm. and what, 35 did the required course. So, you know, the demand is huge, the resource is small. So, what, what can we do? So, so, so I'll go back to the, to the spring break that we do in, in Rosebud. Um, so, it, 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 it's an alternative spring break, uh, mostly understand uh, health and housing issues of American Indians and rural populations. And uh, we had a relationship with the Rosebud Reservation because the student who was the initial co-director of the program um, actually had done his Teach for America two years teaching science and math at uh, Rosebud and wanted very much to figure out a way that he could continue to relate to that community as he was going to medical school. And I sat him down and I said, you know, you got job number one. You got, you know, you want to be a doctor. You, you got to pass your classes. You got to do all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, but I got to. said, let's wait until you, let's wait till you've passed a few tests and see what's going on. He did it beautifully. So I said, what would be a model that students could actually do that would be of limited engagement but good depth? And the alternative spring break model seemed to make a lot of sense. And so we developed a, in, in collaboration with the local, the, uh, the university on site at the reservation, with the local Indian Health Service folks, et cetera, we actually developed a syllabus for them and with our local faculty here. Now what's interesting is that we focused it on health because, you know, you know, when when all you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail out there. I, mean, I, you know, I, do, I do health, but the health is nice because health, everything affects health. So the School of Education came to us and said, well, what's the education like in the reservation? I said, well, I think you should study it as well. And so they actually now have created a separate alternative spring break that will meet our students in Rosebud during spring break. That's based at the School of Education. We think that we could spread to other schools as well. So my sense is that once you develop relationships, then adding different layers, either in a disciplinary way, by looking at different disciplines, or by doing it at different times of the year. I mean, it, it could do, be done in many different ways. But my hope is that we can actually add more disciplines to this geographic location. Yeah. Well, let's see, question. Um, is how to get other faculty interested in this. Obviously, given the reward system here, even though this is all so amazing and wonderful, uh, a lot of the rewards are for other things. So how, how can we get other faculty to want to give time to this kind of thing and to have its unique rewards? So some of it really has to do with considering community-engaged scholarship in your promotional decisions, right? I mean, that's, that's at the nature of this. Um, I would say that some of my more interesting research opportunities that I've had over the last few years have been in this kind of endeavor. And so, so to think of, of you losing research opportunities by moving into an engaged scholarship means what you're doing is delaying them until you develop the relationships. So, so what you have to have is a faculty member who's willing to have, who has the bandwidth, okay, and the time to be able to delay the scholarship until the relationships are built and nurtured. But once the relationships are built and nurtured, 
the, the client is the source of inspiration for the research, it turns out. So I would say that for me, most of the published work that I have had done has recently, I have some work in my field in liver diseases, but, but the work that I've done here has been predominantly related to opportunities that I've seen in um, working with students to dig deep into some of these issues. Yes. professional being educated in South America and not being accepted in the United States uh, is, a, is a kind of a problem, you know, for part of this country to accept other types of medicine, conservative methods in order to prevent surgeries. So it has been very hard for, for me to integrate in here, um, especially here in Stanford. So, so one of the things that our students learn, uh, particularly in, in our international program in Mexico, is their ability to see what, what, is, the, what is the way that our, uh, that our um, communities that we're learning about there actually access health care. Because in the way that they access health care here parallels tremendously the way they access health care there. And so I would say, I mean, there's been studies done but predominantly by Bonnie Bade, who works at... Uh, Cal State San Marcos with migrant communities. And what she's looked at is who is the first contact for a farm worker when a farm worker has an illness? And it's generally their traditional healer, interestingly enough. So the traditional healer is the person who actually sees them first. Not true for injuries, but true for other healthcare problems. Although minor injuries, also traditional healer. And part of it is, is the implied understanding and shared beliefs that they have with that person. So part of the class and part of what's meant to uh, be learned in the class is an understanding of what are the beliefs by which our clients come to our medical care. I'm gonna get some time with you in a few minutes, so I'm gonna say I'm blown away by all the learning outcomes. <laughs> <laughs> I have more. I just, uh, you know, we had a question of time. Anyway. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. Time.